personally believe that when God created everything in the Genesis, it said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said he, he hovered over something that was formless and void, and he took chaos and brought it into order. He separated darkness from light. And when he said, I worked for the six days, he spoke things into existence, and after the sixth day, he entered into rest. And in that, that's a key for us. Adam met God coming out of a season of his rest. So he wasn't laboring. That's why God says, I'm not always going to strive with you. For us to inherit the promises of God, we have to be in a state of rest and in peace. And that's when the revelation knowledge comes to us, when we enter into rest and peace. How many of you, when you're stressed out, fearful or anxious or hearing God clearly. It's like the heavens go brass. So learning how to enter into a dream in sleep puts you into a position that you can hear clearly from God and not just hear, but see. So he's wanting us to hear him and see him so that we're able to function in a higher level. He's, the voice in heaven in Revelation 4 says, come up here and let me show you things that will soon take place. And so there's revelation knowledge that God is speaking to each one of us to come up higher. doesn't matter what level of maturity we are or if we're a beginner. A vision and a dream can tell you things about yourself so that you can recognize the giftings and callings that you have. And when God speaks to you through a dream or through a vision, or he gives you a prophetic word, and he tells you who you are, from that moment on, he never relates to you again as the old person. You have been changed and transformed from the moment he speaks the word, just like he spoke the world into existence. From that point on, he's going to relate to you as he says you are and as he destined you to be from the beginning of the foundations of the world. So the Bible tells us that he created all things. And he did that in the six days and he stored them away in glory. So when we ask God for something, we're not waiting on God to perform something. He's already performed it. He's already done it. He said, it is well, it is good. I've created all these things, and, and man was his highest creation because we're in his image. Our job is to take on his likeness. So we, we go to school, we go to church, we read the Bible, we seek with, after him with all of our hearts so that we can be found. He can be found of us when we seek him with all of our heart. So our purpose is to worship him, seek him, to become like him because we're created in his image, but it takes a lifetime to take on the processes of becoming like him, moving into the power, moving into gifts, moving in revelation knowledge and understanding and having the word written upon the tablet of our hearts. And so dreams really do come true, but we have to pursue the one who gives the dreams. And part of doing that is writing the dream down to make it plain. If you don't pull the dream out of the realm of the spirit and write it down on a tablet or on digital, then it's still out there in some ethereal vapor. And the Bible tells us that dreams are like vapors. And so he said, in order for us to take a dream and make it plain so that we can run with it and there can be a group of people that can run with it, with us to accomplish it, we have to write it down and make it plain. So when when we begin that process of writing it down, it brings it out of the spirit realm into the natural realm so that it can manifest. And every dream that you're ever going to dream is already in you. God gave them to you before you entered into the being born. Remember when Job stood with him and he said, Job, stand up like a man and I'm going to ask you some questions. Where were you when I formed the world and I hung it on nothing? He says, you were there for your days are many. Well, if Job was there, you were there. 
And so a lot of times when we have what the world calls a deja vu experience, it's an already happened event. You have already dreamed it years ago, but the fullness of time has come and it's being unsealed. In Job 33, it says that God speaks to man in one way or another, through a dream, through a vision, and he conceals things to keep man from pride. So years ago, you had an amazing dream that was so off the charts awesome, he sealed it up in you. Because when you had the dream, you didn't have the character or the knowledge or the understanding or the ability to walk that out yet. So now he gave you the dream and the calling of a destiny. Now he has to create the vessel to contain the glory. So you walk out the process. You get the spiritual muscles. You go into the scripture. You renew your mind with the washing of the word so that you can come into a place of thinking the higher thoughts and moving in the higher ways that God has created you to walk into. And you had a dream that showed you that. So you walk out the process and then he says, now you are who I've called you to be. And he unzips the dream and you experience it as a deja vu or a sealed dream is what the bible calls it so now that dream is unsealed how are dreams used to point to a future and destiny where does the motivation for astounding ideas come from every idea that i've ever gotten for a book or for a product or for resources or for anything that's creative and wonderful has come through the holy spirit Jesus is the creator. It says that the whole world is held together by him. It was created in and through him. So all things are held together through our God. And so when he created you, he gave you the potential to be a speaking spirit that could create just like he creates. And in the book of Hebrews, it says that our world is framed by our words. So I always say, if you don't like the life that you're living or the world that's surrounding you, speak something different. Because the words that you're speaking are creating the gateways and the doorways for those things to enter into your life. So when we speak life, we receive life. In Deuteronomy it says, choose life, not death. So if you're in lack, or poverty or sickness or disease watch what your mouth is saying because it's creating something that's gaining access to you and so God says especially in this year of 22 this is the year of the mouth 22 means light and the Bible talks about the light coming on our path he told Job you know you can have light on your path and he says, the light was my crown. And people rejoiced of me because I had knowledge. So in the year of light, we're called to be enlightened by the Spirit of God. It talks about that in Ephesians, that we need to be enlightened with the Spirit of Christ because we are his inheritance. And so God is calling us forth into the higher realms. And he's trying to birth greatness in us and embolden us so that we can discover how successful we're called to be in life. He wants to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. How many Jews are jealous of you? You know, that's our goal, that we know our God so well that they're jealous of us. I remember having a dream a while back, and I was at an airport, and I'm, I'm usually always in there, but I came straight from the airport. So if my mom saw me in these holy jeans, she'd be embarrassed. So. But we came straight from the airport. I'll dress nice tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, I'm at the airport. You know how they'll, they'll do the frisking. They frisk you and everything. Well, as a single woman, that's the most excitement I get in life. <laughs> so they, they always ask me, ma'am, do you want a private screening? And I'm like, Private screening, I don't know. I, you know, they, and it's like you have to assume the position, you know. The, we're only going to use the back of our hands. 
you know, the routine. Well, I'd been through all the screening and the pat down and the private whatever, and I was at the gate to try to get onto the airplane. And there were two people there at the gate, and they posed a question to me, and they said, and who are you? I said, I'm Barbie Breathitt. And their response was, no, you're not. I'm thinking, well, if I'm not Barbie Breathitt, who in the world am I? I have to, oh, throw a title in there. I'm Dr. Barbie Breathitt. That ought to do it. And that will impress them. You know, no, you're not. And so I thought, okay, my dad was an attorney, so now I'm gonna have to argue my case. So I'm, I'm put, digging in my Louis Vuitton with the matching Louis Vuitton wallet, which I didn't own until last week when I was in Alabama. I shared the story and someone gave me a Louis Vuitton purse. Yeah. So now I just need the matching wallet. <laughs> so um, I pull out my license and I'm showing them against my face. And this, I am Barbie Breathitt. I still couldn't gain access. They said, who is your God? And what is his name? Not name, but what are his names? And so from the intellect, I began trying to make a list of all of God's names. And I could name 20, 30, 50. You know, I thought I was clicking along doing pretty well, but they didn't. See, because a lot of times we know our God by an intellectual ascent. And we call a name as almost like it's an incantation. But do we know our God? And the Bible in Daniel says, those who know their God shall do great exploits. And so I knew names that I could list. But after that dream, I dove into the Bible and started digging out the names of God the characteristics of God, the attributes of God. I'm up to like 1,500 now. Because in that revelation, I came to the understanding of part of the keys of the kingdom are through the names of God and the power and the anointing and the glory that that dimension of the name contains. And until I know him in that way, in that dimension, in that authority, and in that power, characteristic, and attribute, and not just here, but experientially, where I can take that name and I can utilize it and release that dimension of the kingdom power through the name of our God. That is knowing your God and doing greater exploits because you know him intimately face to face and how to utilize all the power and authority that he has given to us in a name. And so my name is Barbie Breath. It had gotten me so far. There's a line here on the carpet. I got into the line. I couldn't cross over Dr. Barbie Breath. It. But he says, I give you a new name. And that new name became I am. How simple. I would always wonder, what's the new name God's going to give me in glory? And nobody's going to know but me, him and me. And the name is I am. I am a healer. I am a dream interpreter. I am a minister. I am a prophet. I am a seer. I am a whatever I need to be to win some to Christ. I am through God. Amen. Amen. We become all things to all men that we might win a few to God. We take on those characteristics and attributes of the great I am. And when we know him, we can demonstrate him in power and authority. It's like Job, he said, I knew you by the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. And I repent. And see, God is bringing the church to a place of maturity where he's longing for his bride. And he's wanting a bride who is mature and who knows him, knows his name. You don't even know your lover's name? Your God's name? I was so embarrassed. But I said, God, I've been in full-time ministry 
and I felt lack, I felt like I pulled up short. And so I'm thinking the simple thing when you first meet someone is your name. Hi, my name is, what's your name? And we've known him, but have we? How much more are the unsearchable mysteries of the power of God that we have only begun to scratch the surface? Yet God is calling us to reach beyond the veil. When he came to minister to the woman in Song of Song, she had already bathed, gotten in bed. He came at an inopportune time, wanted to meet her. And she didn't want to wake up at 222-333-444. I say those numbers. Why? Because that's when it comes, right? How many of you? Oh, it's 11-11 again. There he is. That's when he comes to visit the bride. Come on. And you're in bed, and you're tired. You put in a full day. And he's reaching his hand through the lattice. And he's saying, come with me, my beloved. And let me share a secret with you. Hallelujah. Oh, man, I'm so tired. <laughs> oh, you're tired? Okay. That's all right. You sleep. I'll go find somebody who wants to have a face-to-face -face oh, encounter with me. And he's grieved. Oh, Lord. And he goes off into the night to find somebody who will meet with him. And then we wonder... Why am I not hearing from God? Why am I not dreaming anymore? Why are, are because when he came on his time, we were not available. And so he went off. And now we have to seek. Because honestly, when people tell me, Barbara, will you do such and such and such and so? Or I ask somebody, will you do this? And they go, well, let me go ask God and seek God, and I'll get back to you. I'm thinking, well, how far do you have to go? He's right there. <laughs> Just go, what do you think, Holy Spirit? <laughs> yes? Okay, yes. And let your yes be yes, and your no be no. If he says no, the answer is no. But you don't have to go on a 40-day fast. <laughs> and wander off into the wilderness somewhere to find God. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit led us to Jesus and only through the Father can we find Jesus. But once we find Jesus, it says that if we love him, that the Father will come and make his abode in us. So that tells me that not only is Holy Spirit resident in me, so is Jesus. And since I love Jesus, so is the Father. So my job is to learn how to distinguish the Trinity that lives within me and recognize their voice. Because they operate in an audible voice and in the still small voice through perception, spiritual perception, or through the still small voice or a knowing or a dream or a vision or through the rhema word coming alive or through a sign, or through a song, or through a little child that will lead them. How do I learn to discern? And see, I think a lot of times the church, it, we're weak on the discerning of spirits. And so we can get deceived. But if we know our God, Amen. and we know Holy Spirit, we know Jesus, and we know the Father, we Amen. can't be deceived. We have the ability to tap into infinite realms of counsel and guidance and wisdom if we'll only seek the face of the invisible God. You know, we say he's invisible, but yet we can see him in each other. Each one of us is a mirror image of the uniqueness of God manifesting in you. So I know I went to Bible college and went to Southeastern University. It was a college of the AG in Lakeland, Florida. And back then, all the guys looked the same. They had the AG, uh, I guess they teased it up and sprayed it, hair sprayed it. Because even if they got the Holy Ghost on them, that thing did not move. 
<laughs> it was rock solid. And, and I found out that God's name has like seven syllables to it. Because when they said, God, <laughs> and the more syllables that you had, the more anointed you were. <laughs> and so we learned how to do that. And, but everybody became like a cookie cutter. You wore a red power tie. Your hair was done a certain way. Black jacket, black patent leather. And they were looking for a woman who could play the piano. <laughs> because... That is what they needed to seal the deal. That's why I'm still single. <laughs> I, I can't play a lick. So when it came time to date one of them, first question out of their mouth, do you play piano? Are you a worship leader? No, I'm a Bible major. Oh. <laughs> So, but God wants us to be each uniquely ourself and the beauty that he's placed within you. And men, are you're beautiful too. The handsomeness that are in men. Dreams have the power to awaken us to destiny because they're guiding memories. Everything that you're ever going to do is already within you. He knows our days. He's numbered them. There's a scroll in heaven that he has written things. So he knows the decisions we're going to make. He knows everything about us. Even the hair on our heads are numbered. And for some of you guys, it's getting quicker for him to come. <laughs> it used to take a while. You have to dispatch angels. And now they're like, we got this down. One, two, three, strike. And he's down to five. <laughs> but you know, spiritual men are bald men. If you think about Ezekiel, it says that God would take him by the hair of his head and hold him up between heaven and earth. Well, how many times do you think that's going to happen before your hair starts letting go? And so instead of holding him up by the hair, eventually God just palms him. <laughs> you know, pick up the bald head and hang him. So, you know, dreams are wonderful things because... God is the creator of the universe, and he's created within you a script that you can follow. It's a blueprint. And when you see those things played out in the visions of the night, you know what he's asking. But if we don't search that matter out, the Proverbs, it says, it is the glory of a king to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search that matter out. So if a dream comes and we don't go to the Holy Spirit and say, Give me wisdom. Unlock this mystery. What are you saying to me in this? Then it remains a love letter that is sealed. Oh, come on. And we don't profit from it. Mm -hmm. And it vape evaporates. Dream vapors reveal divine strategies and enlighten us to God's perfect plans. Mm -hmm. He has a perfect plan and a permissible plan. I want the perfect Plan. I don't want to walk in something that I'm permitted to walk in. I want to walk in the perfect plan of God. And it's important that we learn to trust the pictures and the images that God shows us in dreams. Yes. Dreams enable us to trust in what no one else can see but you. It's a private showing. You're the only one there in the dream with God. And so he's showing you, this is danger, this is a warning, this is what you invest in, this is what you get out of, this is a relationship you cut off, and he will show you everything that you need to know through the visions and dreams of the night. The number one way that God speaks to his prophets is through a dream or a vision. Yes. And it's not just prophets, every single human being on earth dreams every night. So if you think about the magnitude of God's creative ability, every single human on the earth every night is having at least one dream to answer a prayer, to show them, to lead, to guide, to direct them. And he does it every night for them. Do they operate with the dreams? Do they recall the dreams? Do they write them down? Do they steward them? Do they interpret the dreams? No, majority do not. But if we did, what an asset. 
In the book of Job, it says that a dream interpreter is one in a thousand. Yes. So in this room here, there's one of us. But a lot of times with dream workshops, there's more of a percentage because they're the people who are seeking after God with all their heart. And they want to know the mysteries and they want to learn that mysterious language of this is that, like Peter said, this is that which was spoken. And a symbol representing something. And so God, will, the picture, what's it called? A, a picture paints a thousand words. One symbol can be one thing to one person and a whole other thing to somebody else. Myself, I love big Rottweilers. And I have one named Callie. She's 130 pounds of love. <laughs> and but to some people, they would not want a Rottweiler or any dog because maybe they're afraid of dogs so to them they represent a vicious killer but to me she's just a love love i have a little poster that says all you need is love and a rottweiler <laughs> they could mark out the love because a rottweiler is love it's almost like god god is love if you dog spelled backwards right So our dreams give us a personal, private viewing of the grand plans and landscape of success that is available for us to apprehend. It's important that we become an active participant. I encourage you to put a um, cell phone by your bed. I used to say a pen and pad by your bed, but if you're married, you need a light pen if you're gonna write them down so that you don't wake your partner up because they really don't care what you're seeing at 2, 2, 2 in the morning. And if you're over there speaking onto your cell phone, yeah, there's a flying saucer, and there's a pink elephant on it, and that you're waking your partner up for that, I don't know how long your marriage is going to last. So you need to get a light pen, write it down, and then later go through and search it out, or put it on Dreams Decoder so that we can help you with it. And that's one of the benefits of DecodeMyDream.com is you can, don't send us your interpretation, send us just the dream, but have already interpreted it. So that when we send back an interpretation, you can compare the two and you begin to learn how to interpret your dreams just by having dreams interpreted. So we're gonna be active participants you alone are called to take responsibility for stewarding the mysteries of your dreams that are shown to you. If you don't write them down and you don't seek out the answer, who's going to? And it's really a very intimate language. And God knows your vocabulary and he knows my vocabulary. That's how I came up with over 10,000 symbols because over the years, I have been collecting symbols. I used to be on staff at um, Carpenter's Home Church. It was a 10,000 seat auditorium in Lakeland, Florida. We were on the prophetic team, so anytime they had speakers come in, we would minister to them. And so they kept coming in and saying, I had a dream. And I'm going, we're, we're prophets. We're just going to, I don't interpret dreams. We're just going to prophesy over you. And again and again, I had a dream. I had a dream. And one time I told this major name, I don't like to name drop, so one of these big name people came in and he had had a dream and I said well I don't interpret dreams but we're going to prophesy over you and the Holy Spirit said no you can interpret dreams so I said I meant um, yes I can interpret dreams <laughs> and then I'm on the going what am I saying Why, what am I doing and then he said tell him that um, you're going to listen to the dream I will tell you what the symbols mean, and then you're going to put it together in a few sentences and tell him what his dream means. I thought, well, that sounds easy enough. And so that was my beginning as a dream interpreter in the green rooms, prophesying over big name people. But the Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. So as I would tune in and listen, God would move me in the vision realm to where I would see the dream playing out. Then he would tell me what each one of the symbols meant in context for that person. Then I would just repeat to them what the Holy Spirit had told me as a prophetic word. 
and it made prophesying a whole lot better because now I'm unlocking a mystery that they had and I'm dealing specifically what's on their hearts. And at the same time, I'm collecting dream symbols so that I can write a dictionary in years to come. And that helps all y'all, that's Texan. Y'all, and then there's all y'all. And I, when I moved to Texas, I told myself, I will never say that, never will I ever, but I did. In one meeting, I said both of them, so I knew I had been assimilated as a Texan. <laughs> but my heart is still Floridian. <laughs>